because of it. And we should all be sensitive to that. And I certainly should have been sensitive to that. So let's talk about it now. Joining me now is Naveed Jamali, Newsweek editor at large and my guest on Monday, and Dahlia Mogahed, director of research at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Thank you both for being here. And uh, Naveed, I'm going to go back to you and just play really quickly the, the section of the interview that was in question. When leaders, um, let's say in the Muslim world, talk a lot of violent talk and encourage their supporters to be willing to commit violence, including on their own bodies, in order to win against whoever they decide is the enemy, we in the U.S. media describe that as they are radicalizing those people, particularly when they're radicalizing young people. That's how we talk about the way Muslims act. When you see what Donald Trump is doing, is that any different from what we describe as radicalizing people? Not, not exactly the most artful way of uh, asking that question, obviously, based on the reaction. But, Naveed, can you just contextualize it a better way of sort of making that point, just from a national security well, point of view? Let, let me just tell you what it, what it meant to me with the actual visuals that I had in my mind. You know, I am someone who came of age as the 9-11 generation. And when I think of being a brown man in America, there are two waypoints that define what it means for me, and that is 9-11 and then the Muslim ban. And after 9-11, you know, when you talk about radi being radicalized, we all know the 19 hijackers, who they were, what they were. I felt a very strong urge to counter this, that it wasn't enough just to stand up and say something, but I wanted to, to do something. And the best way that I thought that I could do that was join the military. And that's exactly what I did. And I'm not alone. There were plenty of brown and Muslim men and women, whether they joined the military or, or anything else, wanted to speak out and address this. So to me, what I took that to be is a question of, you know, this double standard that exists when we talk about brown and Muslim people in this country and how we hold us to a, a monolithic standard. You know, as you said, when there's a terrorist act from within our community, we are all expected to apologize, to condemn it, which we do because it's the right thing to do. And that same standard is not often applied to other communities, and it should be a standard that should be applied universally. So I took what your question, not just from a national security standpoint, but I took it as a brown man whose father is Pakistani, whose father is Muslim, and by the way, who watched this segment, and I wanted to answer it in that vein, that I took it exactly the, the, this idea that really we are a country that is a double standard, that has a double standard, and even someone who can serve and prove his loyalty, be patriotic, is then thrown the Muslim ban in his face, just like my, you know, the fellow members in my community. And that's really that double standard that I think we really have to address. And, and I thought that that was what the question was, and I think it's an important one to ask. Well, and Dahlia, I want to let you in on this and let you respond however you want to respond as well. I mean, I, you know, and, and by the way, for the audience, that was not what the entire segment was about. The segment was actually about Donald Trump radicalizing people and his rhetoric. And you can go all the way back to, if you talk about Muslims, him lying about saying, you know, I know that, you know, Muslims were celebrating. I mean, he's done a lot of it. But in that particular yeah. instance, it was about his relationship to the far, far, far right, that he is not discouraging, we'll put it that way. But just to let people know that was not the entire subject of the piece, because this would have been the panel and not that panel that we had yesterday that was about a different thing. But it did come up, and Dahlia, and, you know, I threw that question um, to Naveed. It's something he and I have talked about and both, uh, you know, been angry about for a long time. Um, yeah. But I guess, the, you know, the way that I framed it obviously did not work. So I want you to just respond to me about, like, how that was taken and how that can really be brought up. And do you think it even is a fair analogy to make or a fair question to be asked? Well, thank you so much, Joy. I, I want to first say that I have been on your show before, and you have always given yes. Muslim voices a fair shake. You you are a, a fair reporter. You give us airtime to make our case. You let us speak for ourselves, and you're fair to us when we are on your show. Uh, so I think that that's, that's an important thank point you. to make. Um, the way that I heard your statement was intended to make the analogy, which is a fair one, between radicalization of Muslim extremists and the radicalization of young white men in this country. The way that it came, the way that it landed and the way that it was heard by some people and many people, in fact, was unintentionally um, 
saying that Muslims were inherently violent or that Muslim society, the way Muslims act is, is violent. And, um, and though that was not your intention, it is important to correct that notion for your millions of viewers. And, and that's why I think it's so important to have this conversation, because what the facts are um, is that while Muslims receive the vast majority of media coverage when it comes to ideologically motivated violence, they are by no means the majority of uh, they are not the ones that are committing most terrorism in America. The vast majority of terrorists, uh, ter casualties um, at the hands of terrorism are at the hands of white supremacists and far-right extremists in the United States. Uh, most people don't know that. Um, not only that, but Muslim publics around the world in, and in the United States are more likely than the general public to to actually reject violence against civilians. So you have this media portrayal on one hand, uh, implying and reinforcing the stereotype, while the reality on the other hand says the exact opposite. Yeah, I mean, the, this, the, it, it, and I guess this is why it, the, it annoys me to see the way that Donald Trump has talked about, because you're absolutely right. And there, here are some statistics, and this uh, is from the a Georgia State University study. Muslims, 80% uh, are as likely as the general public, 74%, so more likely to reject violent target, violence targeting civilians carried out by an individual or small group. That is just actual facts. Um, uh, attacks by Muslim perpetrators received, on average, 357 percent more coverage than other attacks. So, you know, Dahlia, it, it, it is vexing because when I see um, the Boogaloo Boys, um, you have an officer who Donald Trump sometimes cite, who was gunned down. They never tell you who gunned this person down. It was a Boogaloo Boys member. It sounds like a silly name, but they're actually quite dangerous. Um, using nearby peaceful protests that Black Lives Matter were holding as a cover. Federal authorities have identified this man as Air Force Staff Sergeant Stephen Carrillo. He's 32 years old. He's a member of this group. I, I mean, it, it, I guess when I don't hear that just described as domestic terrorism in the same way, it irks my spirit. And I wonder for the Muslim community, how does that, how does that land, the, the fact that we in the media don't say immediately terrorism? Well, I think that many of us don't necessarily want everyone to be called a terrorist. Um, and that is a legal term that the media really shouldn't be throwing around against anyone. What we want, though, is simply objective, fair coverage of all communities, of all acts of violence, whether they're ideologically motivated or not. And what we often see, however, is that the term terrorist is only used um, against Muslims, no matter what their motivation might be, and before there is a legal assessment. And, and that really hurts ordinary people. I mean, we know from our research, Joy, that Muslim children are the most likely group, twice as likely as other children, to be bullied in school and, and for their faith. And, and as Javid mentioned, people who aren't Muslim, who, who are perceived to be Muslim, receive the same treatment. So it has real-world consequences. Muslims are also the most likely faith group to report, you know, religious-based discrimination. It, it matters how the media talks about these things because it impacts ordinary people. Yeah, and, and David, it also matters how how our political leaders, and, and I think Dahlia is absolutely right, that let's take that whole terrorism conversation off the table. Just encouraging violence, when it comes from a leader with as much power as the president of the United States, it feels to me more dangerous. Um, you've had, and let's just show that we don't, people don't often show the two men who were killed in Kenosha. These were two innocent young men. They, their names are Anthony Huber and Joseph Rosenbaum. They were the victims uh, in this case. They died as a result of somebody who came from out of state, allegedly, um, and, and shot three people, and they died. Um, one of them was a dad. One of them was a young skateboarder. Um, you have Donald Trump sharing a video on CNN, um, a white nationalist video that he retweeted falsely blaming Black Lives Matter for a 2019 subway assault. So, you know, it's sort of an all everybody's in on on getting blamed for things that they haven't done. And I want you to listen to an ad by a woman named Elizabeth Newman. 
um, who left to the administration. She was a former assistant secretary for threat prevention in the Department of Homeland Security. And then I want to give each of you a chance to respond. But Naveed and then Dahlia. From January until March 